Good evening. It's a delight to be with you. We have a number of folks who are visiting in our number uh, this afternoon. We're delighted to see you and invite you to open your Bibles with us and join us in this study. Uh, The topic that I want to deal with this evening is infant baptism. And as I told James, I don't know that there are any subliminal reasons or motivations for me bringing this particular lesson at this particular time. It's something that's been on my radar for some time that I thought has needed to be talked about. Now, before we get into it at all, I want to go ahead and say one thing. I hope it's not the case, but in an audience, you never know. I hope no one hears that, oh, it's going to be on infant baptism. Well, I know about that. I know all about infant baptism. I know we don't do that here, and everyone here knows that. So I don't know why we're having that lesson. Maybe he just needs a deal with doctrinal point kind of sermon to fill in the the schedule. Well, no, I think most of you know that's not how things operate up here. But a couple of points about that. Not everyone knows about this. You know, a lot of times, those of us who get a little bit older and we've heard sermons and thousands of lessons over the years, I think sometimes we forget that the younger folks don't know all of those lessons and they haven't heard all the sermons we have. And they need to hear these things as well. But there's another reason why I think this is an important lesson to bring. And that is, this is not just something that's academic to me. This is not just a topic that, oh, you know, we like to discuss these doctrinal points and make sure we handle the scriptures aright. This is practical. Just for example, there are friends, for Kate and for me, that we care about dearly. We love them. We're interested in their eternal well-being. But they hold to some of the doctrines we're going to be discussing today. And a lot of us would have friends and associates like that. And when it comes down to it, if a topic like this or a question like this is a hang-up for someone coming to know the truth and obeying the gospel and joining the church that Jesus established, that is a serious problem with eternal consequences. And so when we deal with a topic like infant baptism, everything I say has warmth and interest in this kind of emotion behind it. I care very much that we get and understand this and understand it right. So that's the approach that I'm taking it. And it may be the case that maybe you have settled in your mind this question. What I'm going to present to you, maybe you could just look at it this way. Here are some of the ways, some of the scriptures, and some of the thoughts that you can hear this, you can take it, and then you can make it your own to try and help someone else get to heaven. That's what it's all about. So our topic then this evening is infant baptism. What does the Bible have to say? The two main points to this lesson would be this. Number one, the question, should infants be baptized? As we answer that question, we're going to raise some of the common reasons that people will have for having an infant baptized. And then what I'd like for us to do is to look at the scriptures and to see why it is that they do not need to be baptized, uh, nor can they be baptized with the scripture's authority. And then the second point that I would like to establish is that baptism is for adults. And why is that the case? Why do I believe that the scriptures teach that? These are the two main points and segments of our lesson. So first of all, the question then is, should infants be baptized? A few preliminary points about that, about what the Bible has to say or not to say on infant baptism. I think it's an important fact for everyone to realize, especially those who may have gone through this process or this procedure when they were young or maybe their parents want this. The Bible never, from Genesis through Revelation, never makes any mention of infant baptism. That's just a fact. You can read the Bible cover to cover. Never will you read anything about infants being baptized. To be clearer, there are no explicit commands, and I can even leave it at there are no commands specifically to baptize an infant. There are no examples of infants being baptized. These are facts. We can like them or dislike them, find them convenient or inconvenient. That doesn't change. They are facts. So then, if we are to engage in the practice, it is to be inferred. Anyone who does this, they are inferring, they are making an inference based upon Scripture, if it is to be done at all. 
And so our question then is, can it be accurately inferred? Can it be legitimately inferred? Because it's true that here there are things that we do that you do not find specifically in Scripture, but yet we infer them, all right? We take commands or examples or suggestions of God, if they are to be called such, and then we infer that we are to do them or we are not to do them. And so the question is, is infant baptism in that category or not? Now, why would someone want to baptize an infant? Well, some of the common reasons would be something that's called original sin. This is the doctrine that because of what Adam and Eve did in the garden, because of their sin, they then pass this sin on to the entire human race. And the idea here is that just like I might inherit specific genetic traits from mother and father, the whole human race has inherited the sin from Adam. Now you might think to yourself, well, that's, that's ridiculous. Why would anyone ever believe that? Well, there are some scriptures that are given as the justification for that belief. And now we want to, in a few minutes, look at those scriptures. We want to challenge that reading of those scriptures. But it's not that people are just making this up. They have been misled, I believe, in their understanding of these scriptures. But that's one reason. And the idea then is that baptism will then purge and clean them and sanctify them to address that original sin. But another reason that some give is that they want this child that is now born into the family to be considered part of the church. Now, this would especially be something that's common in Catholic, Roman Catholic families. You know, they are part of the church, and they now want this infant to be part of the family, and being part of the family means you're part of the church. And that's the way it works, as a lot of you know, in Roman Catholic families. You know, the church is as thick as, as blood, that's, you know, the saying that family and blood is, is thicker than water. In the Catholic Church, that's part of it. You want to be part of the community. And so that's why they would baptize their children. Another reason is that they want this to be a token that in the future, this child will grow up to be a young man or woman who will be dedicated to the church, dedicated to the Lord in the future. And so this is kind of like the down payment or the guarantee that this child is meant to be dedicated to God. Can I say something about this before we move on? I would say that these are wholesome reasons and motivations. Just because they're wholesome and sincere doesn't mean that they're correct, though. But I do want to acknowledge that. I think that these are coming from a good place. They're coming from a pure place. But I believe that they're misguided, and we want then to look at the reasons why. So for the practice of infant baptism, there are typically two scriptures among many that are used to justify this practice, and I want to go ahead and talk about that now in more detail. As I said, original sin is this belief and doctrine that you see not just in the Catholic Church, but among Lutheran and other religious groups, that everyone inherits the sin of Adam upon birth. Therefore, baptism is required to deal with that sin. Now, of different scriptures that are cited, there are two what I would call pillars of scriptures that this belief rests on. And the first one is, and we'll look at these in turn, is Romans chapter 5 and then Psalm 51. And so what we will do then, after I give a few preliminary comments to that, I'd like for us to look at these scriptures and to see whether or not this is a legitimate reading of them. Before we get to these scriptures, though, uh, well, here, here are the two scriptures. You can turn there, or I've got them here on the slides. In Romans 5 and verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, or if you jump down to verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Now the advocate of original sin and subsequently infant baptism would say, how else could God say it? By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. How else could he say it? Clear as day. Well, we'll look at that scripture here in just a few moments, but that's one of them. The other one is Psalm 51. Here is this penitentiary psalm, or uh, penitent psalm, uh, where David, after the sin with Bathsheba, pins this. And in verse 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Again, the advocate of this doctrine would say, how much clearer could the Lord be? Here is David acknowledging the fact that he was born in sin. 
Well, what we want to do now is to look at a few principles where the scriptures, I think, are teaching us and telling us very clearly we do not inherit Adam's sin. We do not inherit our parents' sin. Original sin is not a biblical doctrine. But then we want to turn and get back to these scriptures and see what it is that they are saying. The scriptures, I believe, are so clear that sin is not a trait. It is not part of the nature that can be passed down. It is an action and is then a condition based upon an action. Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 3. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, the apostle writes, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So what I find here is that sin is something that is committed. It is something that is done. It is lawlessness. It is a departure from the law of God. So that means that it's something that I do. It's something that I'm consciously doing. An infant cannot commit much of anything, all right? And so the idea here is they are not capable of having any comprehension of the law of God to do it or not to do it. They simply are. They exist. They are growing into a state someday that they will be aware of that and able to commit sin or not. But an infant cannot commit much of anything. Turn also over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Beginning in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Just like in the natural world. There are natural processes. There are physical laws. And here there is a spiritual law, a spiritual process that is described of what sin leads to and what causes sin. The desires that are spoken of in verse 14 and 15 are not just wants and wishes and hopes and inclinations. Because we all have them and many of them, most of them are neutral by nature. So he's not talking about just any old desire here. He's talking about sinful desires, lusts that would be appealed to by temptation and sin. Now, the question is, I am not an expert on the cognitive states of infants, but I take it that they have no such desires as discussed in this passage. It simply does not fit them. They have desires for sure. They have instincts. They know what they want, and they let you know when they want it. But I'm not aware of any kind of nefarious or any kind of sinful lawless desires that they have consider another passage with me Ezekiel chapter 18 let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 18 and there are some principles that the Lord expresses here that if there were no other verse in the Bible these absolutely dismantle the belief that infants are guilty of sin Uh, Ezekiel chapter 18 notice verse 3 I actually want to back up then to verse 2. Ezekiel 18 and verse 2. The Lord says, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul who sins shall die. And again, verse 19. Yet you say, why should the Son not bear the guilt of the Father? Now wait a minute, isn't that precisely the question we're asking? Why should the Son not bear the guilt of the Father? Because the Son has done what is lawful and right, has kept all my statutes, and observed them, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father bear the guilt of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The principles expressed here are infants don't inherit anything, 
And furthermore, righteousness or unrighteousness is purely a function of my decisions. What I choose to do or not to do. And an infant has that without that is outside the realm of his capability to do such. And so because a child is incapable of comprehending ideas like law or sin, grace, responsiveness to God, they're innocent. Does God judge us based on a standard that we're not capable of of meeting or of attaining? And so if original sin is indeed true, what it is that we're saying is that God is judging a baby based on something that wasn't their fault, something they didn't choose, something they didn't do, and judging them on a standard that they can't meet or even possibly attain. That's not the God I know from Scripture, from these Scriptures that we've just looked at. So yes, it is true that sin is not a trait, it's an action and a condition based upon our actions. But that does not answer yet the two scriptures that we looked at just a few minutes ago. And with this topic and with any other, it can never be the case that we say, okay, you've got your scriptures over here, and I've got my scriptures over here, and we're just going to butt them together, and we're going to see whose scriptures win. That's not how this works. We need to not only establish what these scriptures teach, but go and evaluate in that light what these others are saying. Is it the case that these other two are somehow at odds with the other? No. Look at a few ideas that I want to emphasize from, first of all, the Romans passage. So remember, in verse 12, we already read, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. In the context He has just finished in chapter 5 saying, we have been reconciled to God, even though we were sinners, we were at animosity with God, enmity with Him, He now has reconciled us through the death of His Son. And He then goes into the point saying, let's look at it this way, let me illustrate the point I'm making. And so He brings up Adam, and what Adam did in the garden, and so He uses Adam as an example, or that is, as a symbol or a type of Christ. He's making an illustration. And so he is saying that just as what Adam did had consequences and impacted all of us, and the scriptures are crystal clear about that, what happened into the condition of mankind at the end of Genesis 3 is very different than the beginning of Genesis 3. He and his decision, Adam and Eve, what they did had consequences. And notice here, why does death spread to all men? Because all sinned. Yes, what Adam did created and it ushered in the presence of sin into this world, but I participate in it and thus I am a sinner. Not because I inherited sin from him, I do as Adam did. Look on then to verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. The word likeness there is the same idea as image or likeness that we read in chapter 1 of Genesis. The idea here is Adam sinned, and yes, we sin, not like in the likeness of his transgression, but the point being made here is we have all sinned. That's why it is that death passes to all. That's why sin is a reality for us all. Not because I inherit it, but because I joined in on the act. Think about another parallel we see later in the scripture. Again, chapter 5 and verse 19, it seems to teach that we inherit it, but look a little bit more closely. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Now, I want to, again... Emphasize some things with color. If you happen to have color blindness, I'm sorry if this doesn't come. Hopefully I will be able to explain it enough so you see the parallels. One man is Adam. The other one man is Christ. We have disobedience on the one hand, and then we have obedience on the other. And then we have in both cases many, but with Adam's case, sinners with Christ righteous. I want to ask you something. With what Jesus did, 
Does that mean all now are made righteous? No. It's based upon the decision that's made. Is what Adam did just automatically make everyone unrighteous or sinners? No, it's based on the decisions that we make. There are possibilities that are opened by their actions and decisions. But we have to decide whether we'll participate in it or not. What Adam did had consequences. And what Jesus did on the cross has universal consequences. But I can accept it or reject it. And so if I fail to see that, I break down the parallel. It breaks down here and it doesn't work. It's not logical. Consider also another scripture that we looked at besides Romans chapter 5. Psalm 51. Again, remember David said here, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. But before we take this quite literally, there are a couple of other scriptures I'd like to look at that use the same kind of metaphor to describe in a poetic way one's characteristics that they have cultivated over time. Let me give you an example. Also in the Psalms, in Psalm 58, verse 3. It says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Now the question is, are the infants coming out of the womb already speaking lies? All right, they are uttering things, they are vocalizing, but I'm not sure that much is deceptive about what it is that the infant has to say. So of course we know here that this is figurative. What he is saying here is the psalmist now is thinking about the seeming physical success of the wicked. And he's making the point that this so defines them. This has so come to define their character that it's as if they were like this from birth. Think of another example with me in Job chapter 31. This is the well-known chapter in Job that's really the kind of the counterpart to Proverbs 31. You know, the point there is Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman. In Job 31, he is describing the virtues of manhood. And he has described different things like, I have not lusted or exploited a young maiden. And he goes on to say, I've taken care of the poor. I've been good to my workers. And notice what Job says in verse 18. But from my youth, I reared him, that is the orphan, as a father. And from my mother's womb, I guided the widow. And of course, it's absurd, but do we have to say it? That was Job from infancy, from his mother's womb, emerging into the world already financially taking care of the widow? No, what he is saying is, based upon my life and my decisions and my priorities, I have established a track record such that this has come to define me. And so David says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. What we learn here is that this is a commonplace in Hebrew poetry to emphasize the quality, or sorry, the degree to which a quality is something that the individual shares in. And so David here is lamenting the fact that Lord, based upon the series of catastrophic choices I made that led up to this adultery and deception and conspiracy to murder and now the death of my infant son. David says, this, this is who I am now. All right, I've made the choices, that's me. And the whole tenor of the psalm is David's plea to God, I don't want that to define me anymore. I don't want this to be my character He's asking that the Lord would forgive him. And so this comment is not just a statement of fact about his youth. It is a sad statement of fact about his present condition. That he wants the Lord to work with him to change. So these scriptures that we've looked at don't teach original sin. They teach on the one hand that just like Adam, so Christ came to be the new Adam to open up for us the possibility that we can choose to be made righteous and not have to suffer the consequences of what I choose to do like Adam suffered the consequences of what he chose to do. That's all that passage is teaching. And it's a powerful lesson on the tremendous, universal, enduring impact of what Jesus did. And this passage in the Psalms, it does not teach that David was born in sin, 
But it does teach how serious sin is and that we need the Lord's help to address it. So I want to establish with the remaining minutes that we have this evening, the Bible is clear that baptism is for adults. And it's for adults to be forgiven. And I don't want to say this another time because I want it to be assumed. Now, the adult spoken of here, it may be a very young adult. He or she may be a very young man. It may be a very young woman. But it is for someone who has the awareness and the maturity that we're about to speak of. Baptism requires the following mental states and the following decisions that are deliberate. Number one, turn over to Matthew 28 with me. I'd like to read this passage before we draw some conclusions. Matthew chapter 28. We read in Matthew 28, the commission of the apostles, verse 19, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In verse 19, he said, you're making disciples and baptizing them and teaching them to observe all the commandments you. The idea of discipleship here, if we take discipleship to apply to a human being who's not capable of making the decision whether he's a disciple or not, or she's a disciple or not, an infant cannot decide one way or the other, and we take it to mean that, We have watered down and we have robbed such a rich word of all of its meaning. Discipleship means something in particular. And discipleship is a powerful role that we adopt. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is an imitator. A disciple is someone that is so obsessed with their teacher and their master that they lay aside all other concerns to walk in the steps of their teacher. That's what discipleship is. And we absolutely neuter the meaning, absolutely, when we apply this somehow to an infant. A disciple uh, is a disciple of nothing or no one. Baptism requires and it entails commitment to discipleship. But as we read also in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, A lot of you could quote that scripture. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Belief is part of the equation. And baptism here is spoken as being after or consequent to belief. Again, as I would suggest to you, an infant is not capable of having many beliefs whatsoever. Certainly not the belief that's entertained in the scripture. Consider also Acts chapter 2 with me. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 2. In verse 38, Peter's response to the penitent crowd at Pentecost. Chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Go down to verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Part of what baptism entails is repentance. It's a way of saying that I in the past have made decisions, I've made choices, that has been my life, but I'm now repudiating that. I'm setting it aside. I'm denying it. Now I'm accepting then the leadership, as we sang in the song before the lesson, I'm under his control. That is, I am choosing to be under the leadership of Christ. That's repentance. And it also means acceptance. Those who gladly receive his word. What we're seeing here is, is there are certain cognitive abilities and maturity levels that is required and part of one deciding to be baptized and become a Christian. Consider also what's said in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, we'll read verses 1 through 4. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, just after the passage, by the way, about Adam in Christ. 
Chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There is no change in the behavior of the infant after baptism. Nothing has happened. Nothing has changed in them. There's no old life because that's just their life. And there's no newness of life that they are to walk in. It requires dedication to a new life. And finally, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter 3, the apostle has written about the flood. And the flood and the waters of the flood are used as an example here to teach us about what baptism does. If you look to 1 Peter chapter 3, after he mentions the flood water, notice verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the apostle writes here that just like the flood waters bore up Noah and his family and separated them from a sinful, defiled world, and it washed and it cleaned and it purged the sinful world, they weren't saved from the water, they were saved through water. He says, even so, baptism saves us. It is the bearing us up away from the sins of our former selves, it's the purging and the cleaning of what has defiled and here the apostle stresses to the Christians, now you know, and you need to make sure others know, this is not some kind of ceremonial washing, where we think that somehow some kind of physical defilement of the flesh is what's being purified in the right. No, what we are doing is we are appealing to God to clear the conscience that I want to be right with him. It's my way of saying to God that because I'm willing to obey you and to have faith enough to do what you've asked me to do. I want to be right with you. And what makes this effective is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what baptism requires. An infant is incapable of any of these things, which tells me that baptism is not for them. Baptism is for adults. Turn over to Acts chapter 5. As I said before, there are no direct statements of Scripture anywhere of an infant being baptized, but I can find some direct statements of Scripture that just adults were baptized. So look, for example, in Acts chapter uh, 5. In Acts 5 and verse 14, And believers were incre increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Men and women. Why does he mention men and women? I think the point he's, being, he's making here is this is not some kind of cult, some kind of sect that just appeals to the masculine, or it's just some kind of ladies' cult, like some kind of the goddesses and some kinds of the rituals and mystery cults that some at that time would be engaged in, that sometimes were divided and segregated according to sex. I think the point being made here is everyone, men and women, are coming into the kingdom. Look also in chapter 8 with the preaching of Philip at Samaria. In eight, chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Again, this is to be a statement of fact that it's not just one group or the other, but this would have been the, the best of moments to have said, men, women, and children, everyone's being baptized. The Lord had that available to him to communicate if that were indeed the case. And if anyone knew that they were to be baptizing infants, Philip would have been among the ones to have known that. And yet, it is conspicuous by his absence. Baptism is for adults. But someone will say, wait a minute, the Bible says that how entire households were converted and baptized. Look over at chapter 16. Chapter 16, we 
find, for example, in verse 15 of Lydia, when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and say, So she persuaded us. So Lydia and her household were baptized. Look also to verse 33, after he's preached to the jailer. He took him the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. And so the argument is suggested to us, look, the household is baptized, the family is baptized. And so if they were in the family, they were baptized. If they were in the household, they were baptized. Clearly here, this opens the door for infants to be baptized. A couple of points to make about that. So if you read this, it doesn't say one way or the other whether infants were there, whether there were elderly who were there, whether or not there may have been household servants there or not. Does it say whether there were children involved in that or not? So if I'm going to say, well, I think there may likely have been, so there were, you are saying that on the same evidence that I could say, it doesn't say they were there, so therefore they weren't. So there. Well, they're both speculative. They're not full. All right, that's one thing I think is important to remember. But a couple other points on that. I'd like for you quietly to raise your hand if in your home right now there are no infants. Like, I'm serious, please raise your hand. I can't, but <laughs> all right, look around the room. So households with no infants. Okay, thank you. Now, someone might say, well, hold on for a, for a second. These households are not like our nuclear American 21st century homes. So just for the sake of interest, if your grandparents or your parents, if they are still around, have grandchildren. That is to say, if your parents and your children were all gathered together, who still would not have infants in their home if that whole group were gathered together? I know some of you would apply. Okay, see some kind of dotted around here? Okay. The point being made is, just like in this limited small room here, there are families and households which do not have infants. Okay. So if I'm going to base a practice in a doctrinal belief based upon that, that is not solid ground, okay? But there's another point to be made besides the fact that not every household includes infants. I think it's clear that the point being made is that all who are eligible were baptized. And as he said again, he and all his family were baptized. Can I use this example to illustrate the point? I'm going to borrow the, uh, the Jamie and Emily Brickell family. I'll, I'll try not to embarrass you, okay? Let's take them for example. All right. Let's say that, for example, they're going to move to another state. Don't move to another state. You're staying. We're keeping. Okay. Let's say they move, though, in this made-up world to another state. And they get there. They're starting to settle in. You know what you have to do when you move to a new place? Oh, it's so exhausting. You have to go to the DMV. And serve the sentence while you're trying to get a new license, a new registration, all that kind of taken care of. Now, what if their new community were to ask them after a few weeks, uh, are you settling in? And Jamie and, and Emily say, yeah, we all, we all went down to the uh, DMV. We got our driver's licenses changed. Well, I know that they have a couple of children that probably would be involved in that. All right. But they also have a couple of children that I don't think they're driving yet. All right. Eli, I'm not sure. Chloe, I'd be okay with. Eli's a little shaky there. All right. But I'm not sure that they're getting their licenses yet. But could they say that, yeah, we all went down and got our licenses? You now, what's implied is all who are eligible do it. And so I take these scriptures that unless I distort all the others that we've looked at this evening, the point being made is the entire household was baptized. Everyone who's eligible in the household. And it may be that for Lydia and for the jailer, maybe it was everyone involved with that. Or maybe the scriptures are just assuming that we would understand that only the believing, penitent disciples were being baptized in that instance. There are some conclusions to be made before we end this evening. Infants do not need to be baptized. They're innocent. I hesitate to say that infants are saved because they've never done anything to imperil their soul. I think as many often have in the past, they're not saved, they're safe. And when a baby passes away, or a young child who is not yet com uh, comprehending the law of God and their response to him. When these young ones pass away, I believe that the Lord is populating heaven with many souls. 
who will be, in their own way, renewed and glorified for eternity. They're okay. I also would go on to say it's not just that they don't need to be baptized, they cannot be, with the support of Scripture. Baptism is immersion for adults. And it's for adults that their sins can be washed away. Their sins can be forgiven. And that God will add them to his church. That's what baptism is for. So what now? Maybe there's someone listening in. Someone with us this evening. Someone that you care about. You want to study with and help get to heaven. And maybe they were baptized as an infant. And maybe they have not done anything else in the time since. And they are resting their eternal salvation upon what someone else did to them. And if you kind of rethink that just for a moment, should that not alarm you? Can it be that my eternal destiny is decided by someone else? Does it not need to be my decision, my choice? What of the person that may have been baptized as an infant and now rest their salvation upon that? Turn with me to Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, and I want to look in verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here are some individuals that in the past... They did what they believed to be right. They went through a process of baptism. And what Paul announces to them is, this baptism is not the one in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, for the new covenant. It's time for you to have that baptism. And that's what I would say to the dear friend, the family member, the associate who was baptized as an infant. It's time for you to receive the baptism of Christ. So... Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And that's what we urge you then to do this evening. That whether you were baptized as an infant or whether just this evening and in the past days you have been contemplating your soul and your responsiveness to the gospel, we give you an opportunity and the invitation to come. If as a child of God also, You don't want this opportunity to go by without seeking the prayers of the saints here. In our encouragement, the invitation's open to all. If we can assist you and we can help you, come while we stand while Aaron leads us in the song.